Okay. All right. My name is Brandon Jones, and I am a certified LabVIEW architect at Wyman Technology. I'm um, also a platform architect, um, and with that, I kind of my job is to help provide a platform for our engineers to build awesome LabVIEW app applications for our customers. So one of the ways we do that is with our error process framework. So the error process framework is a LabVIEW framework uh, developed by Wyman Technology uh, that aims to provide a better error handling, uh, error reporting experience for um, either the engineer debugging the application or the end user using the application. So we created this tool really to integrate a lot of the things that we use uh, internally, <coughs> such as bug ticket tracking um, and email notifications into a central platform. So we're in the process of releasing this currently to the NI Tools Network. It is not available yet, um, but our plan is to have this uh, available to you guys by the end of this year. So this is kind of the agenda, this is kind of the uh, core components of the uh, error process framework that I'm going to touch on today. So research by RogueWave Software um, states that about 50% of uh, application developers' time is spent debugging their application. Now I realize this is kind of a hard thing to quantify. There's a vast e ecosystem of different software development tools out there in different markets. Um, but I think it does speak to the fact that we do spend a lot of our time debugging an application and it is a big part of the software development process. So I'm confident that by the end of this presentation, um, you're gonna find at least one thing you can take away to immediately go improve your error process framework or your error reporting framework, or even some ideas on how you might start to create your own. So the first thing I'm gonna kinda of talk about is the overall uh, architecture of our error process framework and kind of the uh, interface that the end user would see when they were using it. So, um, so we use an active object design pattern for our error process framework um, with the uh, NI group development suite. So uh, in this presentation, I refer to um, actors. However, we are not using the actor framework for this uh, framework, just to make that clear. So there's two primary components in our error process framework. There is the actor and the stage. So, so an actor in the error process framework uh, is a VI that contains the hooks required to communicate with the stage. Uh, typically an actor is like a higher level uh, application such as maybe your user interface, a data logger, or a DAC engine. So the stage is the VI that kind of aggregates all of these um, actors and handles, uh, basically reports all of their errors, right? So this is the error dialogue process that you would see uh, when one of the actors uh, generates an error. So uh, the first time, so, so the way that this works with the uh, active object is when the first actor is created, the stage is created and then launched. There's only one stage per application instance. Um, basically, they all communicate with each other through user events. Um, so the actors will send user events to the stage, representing the error that they see and reporting it. And the stage uh, can be used to shut down the actors. Now, I will say that that's not the typical application flow. Um, you know, but if you're in, if you're debugging your application and you find yourself in a bad place and you just need to shut everything down, um, you know, this you can do that from the error dialog. So this is kind of our kind of our template <coughs> that we use. I mean, overall, it's a, it's a pretty basic queued message handler. Uh, but there's a couple uh, things that I've denoted here that indicate uh, what uh, allows this to plug into our error process framework. So the first thing on the left is just the creation of the object. So you know this is all group active object stuff. So you're creating a type def DVR, uh, and you are sending a message to the stage at that point, letting you know that you are now registered as part of this um, uh, error process framework. So the second thing on the top is the uh, user exit event. So again, this is you know an option that if you find yourself in a place where you need to shut down your application, uh, you can generate a user event uh, and have all your application have all your actors shut down accordingly. The uh, error DQ number three. Uh, there's not really a ton going on there. It's basically just a standard DQ element. Uh, we're just parsing out some of the data, uh, you know, uh, from that. Uh, the fourth on the right is the uh, report of the error. So. If an error is fed into this VI, uh, it will basically take all that information and send it along to the stage so that it can be displayed. And then the fifth is just destruction of the object, closing the DVR, clearing up references, and letting the stage know that that actor is no longer uh, running. So this is uh, kind of what our error dialog looks like. Um, you know, so any time that an actor generates an error, um, 
this is what you're going to see, right? So the air is going to show up. It's going to give you some information about the air, um, you know, such as the message, the case it occurred in, uh, the node, um, what air code it was, and the timestamp, uh, as well as the actor that generated. So if an error occurs multiple times, we have an occurrences column there, so it basically just increment it, you know, so that you know, hey, this error has occurred more than once in my system. Um, we do limit it so that you can't, you know, overflow the thing. If you have some bug that's generating error at a crazy rate, uh, so we do limit that, um, but that's kind of what that does. Um, so from here, once you uh, see this error, you can acknowledge the error, you can ignore it, or you can shut down. So acknowledging the error is just saying, hey, I understand there's an error in my system, I just want this window to close. Um, if you ignore the error, it uh, temporary for this application lifecycle will tell the uh, stage to no longer <coughs> um, recognize that error. Basically, say, "Hey, if this error is generated, that's fine. I just don't want it. I just don't care to see about it." And then shut down, like I mentioned before. Which you know, if you're in a bad, typically we only ever use that if you're in a bad state um, where you can't really shut down gracefully. Um, that's just another option that we have there. So, so typically the way that this window, you know, you get to this window is if an error is generated, but also you know, we have a system tray icon, so you can access this at any time. Uh, because from this window, there's, as you can see on the top there, there's a couple different tabs. So we use this for more than just displaying an error. We also use this for submitting tickets and, and things like that, which I'll get into further in the presentation. So um, another thing, I guess, to mention is that, you know, this is capable of show, showing multiple errors. So if you had a bunch of errors in your system, they would all appear in that multicom list box uh, and require that they be acknowledged in the order that they were generated. So this is our about tab. I mean, there's not really a whole lot going on here. Uh, this is just a nice place for us to put in there some information. So if our customer's having an issue, they can reach out directly to us. Um, also, we have TeamViewer links, so they can download, install TeamViewer, and we can get up and remotely support them. So um, just another nice thing we have. You can also access this from the, uh, from the uh, right-click menu there. So, so that's kind of the overall architecture. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the more core components. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is how you can customize your error reporting with our error process framework. So here's a couple different uh, other VIs you can use to uh, do this. Um, so on the left hand side here, this is we, we call this just inline error reporting. And on the right hand side, it's a method call. So basically what this allows you to do is, uh, you know, when you have an error coming in, uh, you can basically tell the error handle or the error process framework how it should respond to that error. So there's a couple things up here. Um, you can give it a custom error description, which is just a useful string you can attach to the error message. Uh, a priority, so the way priority works um, is just higher priority errors show up higher in the error dialog window, and it's required that those are acknowledged before the lower priority errors. Uh, whether it's logged to a file or not, I'll get to that later too. Um, whether dialogue is displayed, so maybe you know you have an error that's generated and you don't care to see a dialogue or something like that, you can basically turn that off. Uh, ignore <laughs> error, uh, which is basically the same as just not having the error on the wire at all. Uh, it, but it does still get um, logged to history and logged to a file. And then notification groups. Um, so we have a feature that allows you to notify people uh, of the errors when they occur, and I'll touch on that a little bit later as well. So another tab we have, uh, so since the stage knows of all the actors, right, it knows of all these VI references, um, that makes this pretty useful for us as kind of just a general purpose debug tool, right? So, so from here we can kind of see, you know, here's all the different, uh, you know, VIs or actors that are registered in our system, here's how their custom error handling is configured. Um, and we can see all that information from here. Uh, another nice thing, uh, you know, for debug is, you know, since we know all of this, we can show the front panel or the block diagram of those VIs. So instead of trying to, you know, click your way through a bunch of different VI windows to get to the VI you want to get to, to probe or breakpoint it, uh, you can get to it a lot easier from here. So we, we find this is a pretty useful tool for us when we're trying to debug our application. So just because I was talking about, you know, custom error handling using custom error codes, um, you know, I just wanted to point out these are the custom error codes that NI recommends that you use just so that if you do choose to use your own error codes, um, you're not stepping over previously uh, defined error codes and, you know, just kind of confusing your end user. <coughs> 
So next thing I want to talk about is um, how you can configure um, error notifications in error process framework. Um, so we have the ability to either send emails or send um, SMS text messages anytime you have an error that's generated in your system. So the way we do that, uh, we have another method called to this, uh, to this object, which allows you to define notification groups. Right, so, um, so you can define a group, um, you know, as many email addresses or uh, cell phone numbers as you want. Um, into this group uh, along with how fast they can be notified so we have a, a limit on how fast they can send notifications in case again you have a runaway error you're not spamming someone's email um, along with some other stuff so so there's so the registered for so there's a couple different ways you can get notified about errors in your system so so with all errors you can be notified anytime there's ever error in the system the notification group you have specified here is going to get a notification right uh, unmanaged errors, so if there is an error that isn't configured in your system, that doesn't have custom error handling, um, that notification group will get a message um, as well. And then managed errors, so you know, if we go back to, if we go back here, we can see we have the notification groups, right? So any notification group that was defined as part of this custom error handling, um, they would get notifications about that specific error. So in the way in the way we do so the way we do the uh, SMS text message is basically just sending it through an SMTP gateway. So obviously requires internet connection on the stand, so you can send an email, uh, which would then forward it on to that person. Uh, so the next thing uh, to talk about is how we log our errors <coughs> in the error process framework. So this is the uh, error history window. Um, so, you know, by default, all errors that are generated in the error process framework um, are added to the error history. Um, so you can look at the current history, so that is the history of the, this application lifecycle. So any error that's been generated uh, since this application has started. Um, or uh, you can view, you know, errors that have been logged to file, right? So all errors that are, ge that are generated are automatically logged to the error log file. Um, by default, we use the user public document directory in uh, Windows. Um, and all errors, uh, along with their information, are stored, um, stored in a CSV file format. So when an error is generated, it's logged with the error message, uh, including any custom error description you had if you defined it, um, the, the name of the VI or the actor that generated the error, the case in which the error occurred, um, the node that generated the error, along with the timestamp uh, and the error code. So also, uh, in addition to logging to memory and logging to a file, uh, we also allow you to log to a syslog server. So those are <coughs> familiar with syslog, it's kind of a systems message logging uh, uh, standard that's kind of been around for a while. Um, so we have the ability to also send that information onto that. Uh, so there's a lot of free tools out there you can use to install a syslog server. Um, and one of the method calls to the error object allows you to basically point it to that server so that it could then forward those messages on to it. All right, so, so one thing that I've seen myself uh, a couple times, um, you know, as a customer, you know, maybe finds a bug in your application and it happens because we all don't write perfect software. And, you know, they might give you an email with some vague description of what's going on or give you a phone call, you know, kind of briefly describing the issue. Um, so that, that sometimes is an issue to really kind of get down to the root cause of what's causing the error. So I'm going to show you a better way that we do this um, with the error process framework. So directly from you know the error process framework, we have the ability uh, to submit a bug <coughs> ticket. So so we use Redmine. Um, it's open source uh, bug tracking software. We've had pretty good success with it. It's you know adopted by the uh, community pretty well, and they have a pretty good ecosystem of plugins. So, so basically what we do is we have a application and we will tie it to a Redmine project. And then any time that you know, the user gets an error, um, they can then go to the submit ticket tab and they can uh, you know, fill in their contact information, name, email, all of that information uh, and send us a bug ticket, right? So, so there's a couple things that are you know, really powerful about doing it this way, right? So if they're going to submit a ticket in this fashion, 
they're going to do it right after they get an error, right? So in terms of what they did to create that error and how we can try to recreate it, that's going to be very fresh in their mind. So they're going to be able to give you a pretty good description of what the error is and how you might, you know, go about recreating it. So the actual error messages themselves, you know, such as the timestamp, the error code, things of that nature, all of those are automatically going to be included with the bug ticket submission as well. So, I mean, you'll have a good picture of, you know, what the system looked like at the time that, you know, the user submitted the ticket. Um, so also another nice feature is the customer has the opportunity to upload files to the bug ticket as well. Um, so that's kind of nice if, you know, maybe, maybe they have a screenshot of something they can't necessarily describe in words or they had a configuration file or something that um, you know, caused the error and they can include that with it so that you can try to uh, you know, kind of support them with that. So another thing too is that um, if, if for whatever reason, I know a lot of these stands don't actually have internet connections, so um, you can actually, uh, so for the email digest, you can actually download that as well to a human readable file so that you can then distribute that to someone else. So you can't submit a ticket without that, but uh, it's another way to at least bundle all that information together and get it to someone so they can try to debug your application. So one challenge with uh, we found with error reporting in large applications is it's how do you, you know, report errors across distributed systems? So maybe I've got a real-time chassis and I've got a Windows chassis, uh, Windows PC, right? So how do I communicate those errors across them, right? So, so I'm going to talk about next, you know, how we handled that in the error process framework. So in the error process framework, we have a uh, architecture called REPS, basically, and that stands for replica, primary, and secondary. Uh, and basically what that is, is it's defining an application <coughs> as uh, one of these three different states, right? So, so in this case, a replica node um, is just going to stand on its own, right? So it's only going to report errors to itself. You can see... You know, basically, um, basically the vertical lines are separating different applications, right? So on the left, you can see replica. There's a single actor who's sending an event to its stage, saying, "Here's my error," right? So that's the default implementation. So if you didn't configure it at all, that's basically how it would operate. And the primary node um, basically acts as a TCP server, right? So it is saying that I'm going to report errors to myself, but also I'm going to open up a channel for someone else to report errors to me so that I can display them in my window as well. Um, and then the secondary node, um, you know, is basically the client to that connection, right? So the secondary node, um, you know, isn't going to have an interface to show its errors. So it's going to send those over TCP to the primary node so that it can display those errors. So, so we use the combination of TCP and UDP for this implementation. Um, I mean, at a high level, your primary node is going to be acting as your TCP server, uh, and your secondary node will be acting as your TCP client. <coughs> so, so with a replica node, there's no additional configuration that's needed. Like I said, this just stands on its own, and it doesn't know about any other applications in the space. Um, so, so with that, there's kind of two different options um, that you can configure for how the primary and secondary node uh, communicate. So there is a point-to-point uh, -point configuration and a broadcast configuration. So point to point is pretty straightforward. It's the most simple of the implementations, right? So the primary node, you would provide it with, uh, you know, the IP address you want it to bind to as well as the port. Um, and then it would start listening on that port and then you would have to pass that information on to your secondary nodes so they knew who to connect to and where to send their errors. So that's point to point. We also have broadcast. So broadcast uh, uses UDP multicast uh, to basically broadcast its TCP connection information. At the end of the day, they're still going through a TCP connection, um, but there's just some basic, uh, you know, UDP communication where it'll broadcast what that information is, so that the secondary do node doesn't explicitly need to know that information. It can just find it, you know, assuming it's on the same network. So, so here's kind of a list of all the other, you know, methods and uh, features we have. You know, I kind of touched on all of the. Uh, the high level uh, the ones, but these are kind of the other things that we have as well. Um, you know, we have the ability to, you know, set a proxy so that if you need to send an email out uh, through your network and you have a proxy network, you can set in those settings so that it'll do that. Um, you know, you can customize the error history length, how many errors you want to keep in memory, uh, change where your error log file is, um, change the timeouts internally to how the, uh, to how the error process framework flows. 
as long as also uh, setting version information for the software. So another thing that is included with the bug ticket submission is the version of the software that is set internally to this object. So it's just another data point that can help uh, when you're trying to debug your application. So again, the error process framework is not currently available. Um, you know, we're in the process of releasing it and we're hoping to have it out by the end of this year. Um, so in lieu of that, kind of my goal was to you know, give you guys some ideas uh, on things that you might take and try to implement into your framework um, you know, uh, to, uh, to make that better. So uh, questions? Yes? The dialogue you showed in that like it's going to take it and log it. Yes. How customizable is that on the application? I don't need to write the thing. Red mine, right. Yeah, I mean, that's. Can you remove some of those tabs and things like that? Yes, yeah. So that was, that's another thing. Yeah, so, um, so. You know, we're in the process of trying to, this is, this is kind of how it exists for our current implementation at Wyman, but we're in the process of trying to, uh, you know, make that a little bit more scalable, reusable, you know, allow you to configure it a little bit more. So I kind of mentioned, you know, the bug ticket submission with an API. The thought is we would find, you know, this isn't something we've quite figured out yet, but find a way to allow you to plug into other bug tracking, you know, systems, for example. Um, to do that. Also, in addition to you know submitting directly to Redmine, you can also just send an email with the same information. So there is kind of a way to get around that. Um, but we're kind of working through how how do we how do we you know make this configurable so that you can plug in the tools that you like to use um, you know to work with this. Yes. So in your creed, are you just launching your asynchronous stage and then? Exactly, yeah. So we just use the uh, the group active object process VI basically, right? So so it's going to, um, you know, create a DVR um, and it's going to check. So if it's not been created, I think it, it's just a, basically it's just a named queue where it'll create a named queue of the, uh, that type. And if it exists, um, it won't create it. If it doesn't exist, it'll create that VI, launch it asynchronously, and then everything's communicated through uh, user events between those two. <coughs> Anyone else? Any other questions? Yes. Hey, Brandon, is there uh, any reason why if there's someone in this room that might infuse us, we would release a beta version soon? Is that, is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, where you're at. yeah, I mean, we're in the process of it, right? I mean, I know there's certain steps uh, and things we need to do to get it on the tools network. That's a pretty exhaustive list of things. Uh, but uh, our plan is to release all of our reuse, right? I mean, we want this is this is a part of our reuse but we want to release all of it. So we're in the process of releasing it all kind of as a package unit. Um, so that's you know taking a little bit more time. So we're, we're also uh, talking to somebody that owns a really distributed uh, tape machine that a lot of people know. Um, so we're talking to them. <laughs> <coughs> Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if we actually have something that'll stop that in there. <laughs> um, I mean, typically we would, um, you know, typically we would have some kind of cap on a file size or something like that where we would limit that. I don't think that's in there currently. Um, but that's good. That's good feedback. I mean, like I said, this is something you know we're you know developing and still working on. So that's so that's useful. So thank you for that. What was the question? What's that? What was the the question was, how do you handle, um, you know, file size when you're logging errors, right? Yes? Uh, do you have any sort of security built in? Uh, in messages between the TCP IP uh, client and server uh, necessary to log in uh, to access the uh, No, we don't. Um, so you mean just kind of like SSL or something like that? Maybe mm -hmm. just, okay. No, we don't have that in there currently. Um, the reps feature is kind of a newer feature we've released. I mean, that's great though. I mean, I think that's I, th I think that's a good point in that distributed systems you do want to try to encrypt those messages, right? So I think I think that's a good feature to have. So definitely something we could you know include in there for sure. I don't know if Brandon mentioned it at all during the Yeah, I mean, there, there's, we can limit, yeah, I mean, there's something, so we can limit basically what tabs are visible if, you know, you might not want a customer to have, you know, the availability that a, uh, someone debugging the application might have, right? So, 
So that's something we've worked on as well. Anyone else? Any more questions? Okay. All right, so um, so before you guys go, I just wanted to mention that you can find all these session materials um, at niweek.com slash niweek, um, as well as the mobile app. So the presentation that I've given today is available up there. Um, I'm going to stick around for a while. Uh, I know this was a little bit shorter, um, but I'm here to answer questions that you guys have. Um, so if you have anything, let me know. And uh, other than that, um, thanks for attending and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.